Welcome to the 138th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Dennis Palumbo, author of Night Terrors, a Daniel Rinaldi mystery. Stay tuned for the interview. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Dennis Palumbo, author of Night Terrors, the third book in his Daniel Rinaldi series. Dennis, welcome to the podcast. Oh, it's nice to be here, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Sure, definitely. Well, as we get started, I wondered if you could just read the first page or two of Night Terrors. Sure. Great. The killer and I sat together in the back seat of the late model Range Rover, our shoulders just touching. Wesley Kerm, early 20s, in jeans and a faded Beer Me t-shirt, shifted uneasily next to me, rubbing his cuffed hands beneath his knee. His face, profiled in the half-light, glazing the snow-encrusted windows, was narrow, acne-pitted, hard-planed as though etched with acid. His bony frame, so slender he seemed swallowed up by the threadbare county parka, practically vibrated with banked anger. I turned away from him to stare out my own side window, out at the gray blur of blowing snow beating sideways against the car, as though propelled by a rage of its own. Beyond that relentless swirl of dirty white flakes clinging wetly to the window glass stretched the dark forested, isolated landscape of rural West Virginia, far from the interstate and highways, from the lights of the beleaguered small towns and gasping, dying farms. I shivered in my own police line parka and gloves, my hurried summons down here from Pittsburgh, the desperate phone call from Detective Chief Avery Block, the nerve-twisting drive through a rattling storm to Wheeling PD headquarters, then over just plowed county roads to the main lockup to meet Wes Curham himself. All this urgent, headlong momentum had left me little time to think about what it was I'd actually agreed to and why. I glanced then at the two officers in the front seat, or to be more precise, at the backs of their heads. Though the temperature was just above freezing outside, the dashboard heater was pumping waves of thick, airless heat into the cramped forward area, and both men were sweating. Dark drops beaded the clean lines of their regulation haircuts along the backs of their necks. The older of the two, in the passenger seat, was Chief Avery Block, far past middle age, balding, thick-waisted, furiously chewing his ever-present nicotine gum. When he spoke, which was rarely, it was more like a grunt, the labored effort of a beaten, disillusioned small-town cop for whom things hadn't exactly worked out as planned, and who no longer cared who knew it. In the driver's seat next to him, Detective Sergeant Harv Randall, barely 30, lean and wiry, gloved hands tapping anxiously on the wheel as he peered through the storm-blurred windshield. Dark sleeves of snow were pushed to the side by noisy wipers, only to be replaced by fresh clumps. This your first visit to West Virginia, Doc? Randall asked me this without taking his gaze from the windshield. His boss, with an obvious cough, turned to look at him through weary, roomy eyes, chewing slower now. I figured I'd better stop there. That's okay. The That's great. That's great. Well, if someone listening hasn't heard about Night Terrors yet, how would you describe the novel? Well, it is the third in my series featuring a psychologist and trauma expert named Dr. Daniel Rinaldi. And the, story, the setting of the series is Pittsburgh. And this is my hometown. I was born and raised in Pittsburgh. And even though I've lived in Los Angeles for four years, it has a very strong pool on my memory. And the stories are how Daniel Rinaldi, who is a consultant for the Pittsburgh police, is an expert on trauma. And he specializes in treating the victims of violent crime, people who may have survived a kidnapping or may have been a bank teller during a robbery or may have been carjacked or raped, and who are still traumatized by the experience, uh, usually having symptoms like post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, the, the uh, constantly reliving the experience 
uh, anxiety, dread, nightmares, a kind of hypervigilance for, for real or imagined future dangers. And uh, this is the third in the series, as I say, and it's called Night Terrors. And the story, quite simply, is that uh, an FBI profiler who's just retired after spending 20 years in the heads of the world's worst serial killers can't sleep through the night. He wakes up screaming, uh, sweating, his heart pounding, the classic symptom of night terrors. And the FBI bring in Daniel Rinaldi, my hero, uh, to help him with this problem. And all of this is made a lot more difficult because there's an assassin going through the city and uh, the FBI agent is on this assassin's hit list. And so that's the story of night terrors. That's great. Well, I know that in addition to your novel writing, you, you also work as a psychotherapist. I, I was curious, does your work as a psychotherapist ever give you ideas for your fiction or are they separate in your mind? No, they're, they're very interconnected. It's not like I take stories from my patients' lives. But, sure, sure. You know, I've been, uh, I, I was initially a screenwriter for 17 years, and, um, and then I became a therapist. And part of my training as a therapist was at a, uh, as working at a private psychiatric hospital. And so I learned a lot about the hospital system, the mental health system. And so I transposed a lot of that knowledge uh, to Pittsburgh. So... Uh, in Mirror Image, my first novel, much of the action takes place at a Tony private psychiatric institute. And um, I, I, I know a lot about schizophrenics, having treated them for years and years. And so one of the things I've borrowed from my life is that my hero, Daniel Rinaldi, his best friend, Noah Fry, who runs a bar called Noah's Ark, is a paranoid schizophrenic who's an outpatient whose uh, who's, uh, delusions are maintained through medication. Um, and so what I find in my books is I have the opportunity to talk about the things that interest me, like how Pittsburgh as a city has changed over the years from the one I knew growing up to the one it is now, how the mental health system, both public and private, works, and how victims of trauma deal with the aftermath of the traumatic event. And one of the things that I have found, for example, is that with the you know the fears of terrorism, the faltering economy, the the um, you know the natural disasters that are out there, people are traumatized now in a way they never have been before, and I think that's one of the reasons so many readers have related uh, to my stories because so many people feel traumatized, and Daniel Rinaldi, my hero, has himself suffered a great trauma. Uh, he and his wife were mugged years before, and she was killed by the mugger who's never been found. And he had to tolerate his own survivor guilt and trauma and come out of it with a sense of mission to help those others who have been traumatized by some violent experience. Sure, sure. Well, well you, you, you mentioned uh, earlier in passing that you were a screenwriter for 17 years Right. What, what what was that experience like? How, how did you how did you first get into uh, um, Hollywood and the screenwriting business? Can you can you tell us about that? Sure. I, I to be honest, I think I was very lucky. Um, you know, I was a very young man. I was in my early twenties, and I was trying to break in as a film or, or TV writer, and uh, I couldn't get anyone to read my material. So I began doing stand up at the comedy store on Sunset Boulevard here. Uh, hopefully to be seen by people. And uh, I was a very bad comic, but I had very good material. And uh, Gabe Kaplan saw me and, and liked my material, and I went on the road with him, helping him, writing material for him. And, and before you know it, I ended up on Welcome Back Cotter on the writing staff with my then partner, Mark Evanier. And uh, I was in television for years and years, and then finally, as a solo writer, I went off and and did some features. I guess the one for which I'm most known is My Favorite Year with uh, Peter O'Toole. And, um, but I also did another one called Whitewater Summer with Kevin Bacon and uh, Sean Astin. And I was very lucky. I had the opportunity as a TV and film writer to travel all over the world doing research on projects, uh, to see my words, um, you know, done on screen, on the big screen and the little screen. I was very, very lucky. And, um, but when I changed careers, 
and became uh, a psychotherapist. I've been a, a licensed psychotherapist in private practice for about 26 years now, I guess. And I specialize in creative people. My patients are all writers, directors, actors, composers. So uh, I think I'm sort of uniquely qualified to do that. <laughs> but years ago, ever since I was a kid, you know, the, it's so funny. When I got hired to um, become a writer on Welcome Back, Cotter, I think I was 24 or 25, something like that. That same week, I sold my first mystery short story to Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. And it was a real twofer, <laughs> the like of which I haven't had again. But uh, it was really terrific. And I, But it's always been a goal of mine to have a series character. I've, I've loved mysteries since I was a kid with the mumps. And my dad brought home this wonderful hardcover illustrated book, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. And I remember cracking that binding. I can still smell the paper, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was entranced. I mean, how long had this been going on, I wonder, you know. And I've been a huge fan of mysteries ever since and always wanted to have a series character. And so, uh, you know, now that my practice was established, I thought, well, maybe I'll start doing it. And so that's where the Daniel Rinaldi series came from. That's and, great that, that you mentioned about selling your, your first short story the same same time that you were, you know, joining Welcome Back, Cotter. Over the years, were you were you also writing prose at the same time that you were writing screenplays, or did you kind of... Always that writing. One? Yeah, I, 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 you know, had a lot of short stories published, and I also wrote a lot of nonfiction um, articles for the LA Times and New York Times, places like that, and... In fact, once I became a therapist, I wrote a column for the Writers Guild magazine called Written By, and uh, I wrote a monthly column for six years for that magazine uh, about the issues that writers deal with, you know, procrastination, writer's block, fear of failure, anxiety, depression, loneliness, you know, the usual suspects. And I really think my practice was built on the success of that column. And I even collected all the columns in a book called Writing from the Inside Out. So I do have a nonfiction book out there, as well as these Daniel Rinaldi mysteries. Great. Well, I'll have a link to that in the show notes so people can check out your nonfiction as well. Uh, how, oh. do you, how do you feel like your screenwriting has impacted your, your mystery novels? I think in two ways. Number one, pace. I, I, I really do... Uh, I think I have a good sense of pace. Most people call my books page turners, um, which, you know, I'm very pleased about. And the other thing is dialogue. Uh, I love writing dialogue. And, you know, in film and television, you really learn to say a lot with a little. And that really good dialogue uh, reveals character. And uh, the thing that I'm most proud of in my Rinaldi series is the rich characters that inhabit the book, not only my lead, but his best friend and the policeman he works with. And their interactions, their dialogue is my favorite part of the book. The hardest part for me is the plotting and the mystery and stuff. But my favorite part is uh, the scenes revealing character and the, you know, the humor and conflict in, among the characters. And I think that was really born out of my experience uh, as a TV and film writer. And in your in your work with creative people, I mean, do you, do you see any kind of commonalities of of kind of the stressors that creative people are are under these days? Yeah, I. It, it's funny. Uh, you know, when a person comes in to see me, often um, they're presenting with an issue like, "Oh, I have writer's block," or "I'm procrastinating," or whatever. And within a matter of weeks, we're seeing how their own personal histories and psychology is so inexorably bound up in their writing that it's often the root of the problems they're having. So there's not like a one-size-fits-all way to approach a creative person's issue. But primarily the issues are around um, uh, being blocked or procrastinating. Uh, there's a lot of depression and anxiety uh, creative people are prone sometimes to uh, loneliness and uh, feelings of uh, fear of failure. These are the kinds of issues that can really undermine you and have 
you know, uh, it has less to do with talent, I think, in terms of making it than it does in terms of coming to some sort of self-acceptance about, you know, your psychological issues. And, you know, the thing is, it's hard enough if you're a writer to be blocked and not know what to do next on a story you're working on, let's say. But it makes it ten times harder if you give that block a meaning. If you go, well, I bet John Updike was never blocked, or boy, I bet Michael Connolly never gets blocked. If I were a real writer, I'd never be blocked. Or maybe I'm blocked because this story is terrible. Or maybe I'm blocked because my parents were right and I should have gone to law school instead. I mean, the issues that writers struggle with are common to anyone who tries to create. The difficulty is when we assign these struggles a meaning that has to do with some defect in ourselves. Sure. I mean, the first thing I think when a writer comes in and says, I'm having a lot of trouble writing the script or this book, I think, yeah, writing's hard. You know, it's not a... (laughs) You know, it's not stocking shelves in a supermarket. It's very, very difficult. And and without kind of rehashing your your entire you know nonfiction book about writing, I'm just curious. I mean, do you have any kind of overarching suggestion for uh, writers and creative people to be able to turn off that that kind of judgmental voice inside of them? Well, I I don't think we should try to turn off any voice. I, I I'm more <laughs> into it. In other words, if you're finding yourself, you know, with a, a very deep inner critic, let's say, that says, ah, oh, you don't know what to do with this scene, or, ah, oh, God, this scene you're writing, I've seen it a million times, whatever. I think you're better off to actually stop right there and write a dialogue between yourself and your inner critic. Or take, uh, if you're feeling stuck or unmotivated or disheartened, find some character in your story who feels that way and let them sit in a bar or a diner and talk to someone about it. In other words, use the feelings inside you to animate scenes that you write. And even if these scenes are not going to end up in any form in the thing you're actually working on, it will move you past ruminating on your feelings and get the stuff out on the page. And, okay. and the, see, to me, the, the, the overarching theme of my, my feeling about writing is that you are enough right now to be the writer you want to be. I mean, most of the patients I see come in and go, oh, if I only were smarter or if only I had had more exciting experiences, like, I mean, gosh, Hemingway was an ambulance driver in World War I. How come I didn't get to do anything neat like that? Or if only my you know, father was the editor at Simon & Schuster. You know, there's always, if only I went to Northwestern, if only if I were in the Ohio Writers Program, And these are all fantasies that if you had a different life, if you had enough therapy, if you took the right pills, some perfectible version of you would sit down and write. And my argument is always that as a creative person, you are enough right now to be the writer you want to be. I can't tell you how often people have said to me, man, I I wish I could take all of my fears and my doubts and my insecurities and just shove them out the door, and then I would sit down and write. And I say, write about what? Those doubts and fears and insecurities are what you share with every other human being on the planet. They're the raw materials of narrative and storytelling and character. You've got to bring those things back in. So... I often find that the very things that most writers wish they didn't have are the raw materials of the best part of them as a writer, if they're only willing to explore it. That's 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 great. That's great advice. It's not it's not um, you know it's not typical. You know if you if you read many of kind of you know uh, writing you know how to write books. So I think that's I think that's great advice. I'm curious. Um, outside of what you just kind of articulated, what what general advice would you offer someone who who may be listening, who is an aspiring writer and would like to have their own uh, fiction or screenplays uh, um, published or produced? I think the best advice is the advice Hemingway gave, which is write a million words. Um, you know, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's recent book, Outliers, talked about how a person becomes an expert if they spend 10,000 hours trying to do something. 
and my experience is most people who want to be writers spend too much time um, taking classes and reading about writing and not enough time actually writing. Uh, I, I really think that the best way to break into a very difficult business, because the marketplace is changing so radically, is to write a lot and to write the stuff you would read, not to like look at the bestseller list and go, oh boy, you know, historical mysteries are selling right now, so I'll write one of those. I think you should write what it is you love to read and 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 you know have a real passion for, because no matter how many writers are out there, they don't have your voice. You have this unique voice, and your job is to put that voice out there. You know, the, the thing I always say to people is keep giving them you until you is what they want. And um, that's what I've always done. Um, you just again, have to, that's, that's great advice. You have to keep putting the work out there. I remember one time uh, I met Ray Bradbury, and he was talking about his early years as a, as a short story writer. Now, now, this was, you know, way before the Internet and stuff like that. And in those days, um, you're probably too young to know this, but I do, you used to send a short story out to a magazine, uh, and you'd stick a self-addressed stamped envelope in it. So if you got that envelope back that you had self-addressed, you know the story got rejected. And what Bradbury told me is that whenever he got a story rejected, he would take it out of the envelope, put it in another envelope, address it to another magazine, and get it out in the same day. And he would do that as long as it took until that story sold, even if it sold to, like, the Australian sheep herders daily. He would never stop until every story landed somewhere. And that's the kind of cottage industry industriousness that I think a writer has to have. I've always loved that story. Yeah, that's a great story. So when you when you sit down to work on your fiction, do you have any type of specific writing rituals or, or um, for when you start working? Um, not really. Uh, I don't really have a, a right. Uh, sometimes I just crack my knuckles, you know, I, <laughs> arms overhead and crack my knuckles as though somehow that's my mystical symbol of I have to start now. Um, but I don't have I don't other than that, I don't, you know, and even though I write fairly complex thrillers with twists and turns, I don't outline or plan. I never have any idea what's going on. Um, I just plunge in based on, you know, I'll see a character in my mind, like the pages I just read to you. Uh, I just saw my hero sitting in the back of a police car with a killer. That's all I had. I didn't know who the killer was. I didn't know where they were going. And I just started writing. And, you know, I don't recommend that for everyone, by the way. Some of my most successful writer patients uh, outline, you know, very prodigiously or have, you know, 150 three-by-five cards up on the bulletin board and have every scene laid out before they'll start writing. And that's a very honorable way to do it. But I always just grope my way through it, um, which means, you know, sometimes I... I write my way halfway through a scene that doesn't work, and I have to throw it out and start again. But I don't mind going down back alleys because I'd rather write than think, if you know what I mean. Sure, sure. Sitting around, you know, plotting out something is my def. I mean, I might as well be doing algebra homework. That doesn't <laughs> appeal to me. <laughs> appeal to me is okay. Daniel's in the back seat of a car with a killer. It's snowing. Where are they going, and why? Oh, let's find out. Got it. And that's how I started Night Terrors. That's great. So so what writers or books, either fiction or nonfiction, have you read in the past year or two that you that made an impression on you and that you would recommend? Oh, I've read a lot. I I <laughs> uh <laughs> I read a lot of nonfiction, but um uh, I also read uh obviously a lot of mystery fiction. Um sure. I I like CJ Box a lot. I like uh, Michael Connolly. Uh, I read an interesting book called Await Your Reply by Dan Chone, which I, I thought was really, really good. And uh, a nonfiction book called Wild by Cheryl Strayed, which I thought was really good. Um, but, the, you know, the, with, with, when it comes to mysteries, a lot of the time it's just the usual suspect. Sure, you know, sure. 
you know, Connolly and Dennis Lee Hain and Nelson DeMille. I really like them. Um, but I also very much like uh, slightly more literary kinds of mystery writers like uh, Richard Price. I, I'm a big Richard Price fan. And a guy named Casey Constantine. I like him a lot, too. Sure, sure. Well, uh, and, what, what, did, what are you writing now? Well, right now I'm um, just noodling the fourth Daniel Rinaldi mystery. Um, I haven't started it yet, uh, you know, to my publisher's chagrin. I know most mystery novelists are knocking out a novel or two uh, a year, but I have a full-time private practice. So my novels take about two and a, two and a half years to write because I just write a little bit every day. But uh, I'm noodling with the, the, the fourth one. I, I'm pretty sure I think I know what it might be about. And, and all I have to have is a notion. And then I'm off and running, you know. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Dennis Palumbo, the author of the new novel Night Terrors, which is available in bookstores now. So definitely grab a copy. Dennis, That's thanks for night- doing the... By the way, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but That's okay. it's really funny. Night Terrors, which is published by Poison Pen Press, uh, is out. I guess this is the modern world. It's out in hardcover, trade paperback, large print, audio, and ebook. And I was thinking the other day, the only format left is I come over to your place and read it aloud. I mean, <laughs> amazing how many formats a book comes out in now. Yeah, it is. That is amazing. Well, well, Dennis, thanks for doing the podcast. Oh, it was my pleasure. Uh, You asked really interesting questions, and I hope I gave you decent answers. You did. You did. Thanks a lot.